yeah. Hi, my name is Colin Finley. I'm a photographer, musician, writer, director, all sorts of different hats I wear. As a photojournalist and documentary photographer, it's a good 30 years now I've been working, probably like 1989 is when I first started. For me, photography started, I would say 1989 is when I ended up on the streets of Belfast, Northern Ireland. And that really was the the, the genesis of my entire career. And my God, that, that, that pointed the direction down to South Africa that pushed me into the war in Sarajevo genocide in Rwanda in 94, Darfur in 97, wars in the Middle East. I mean, those first 10 years of my career were really tumultuous and really intense and very traumatic and very, you know, powerful. Um, that sort of slowly led itself into another series of documentary projects on disappearing traditions. There's a whole series of other projects and stories that just moved me forward um, with photography and then into video that I was doing because I started to incorporate video work that I was doing for probably five years doing these documentaries and doing film pieces for television as well that eventually led into advertising so it's so such an incredible blessed journey that I've had um you know and then in, in 2006 that moved out to a big project with Vanity Fair that moved into other projects I did with Adobe, with Microsoft, and I became a spokesperson for those companies. All of it just moved me forward piece by piece into what became Hearts Road, which was a culmination of my entire career. So it took in, you know, from actually day one, um, all of my work, and it's an hour and 34 minute referred to as non-narrative documentary, meaning it's a musical journey and a photographic journey. There's no one telling you what to think or what to feel. And for me, it was incredibly vital that I wrote and composed every note of that score. And that, you know, that that the documentary has been so incredibly well received. It's quite staggering. But I really, the idea of not having narrative in it was that I wanted this to play as beautifully in Reykjavik as it does in Buenos Aires, as it does in Osaka. It's speaking to people in their own language, which for us, for me, is a visual language and it's a musical language. And that was kind of where I wanted to, to jump off. And that's where Hearts Road, you know, took me. Then that's pushed into the Hearts Road novels and all the different stories that go along with that. So it's been, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> I mean, for me, having an opportunity to work with a museum again, I mean, this has been probably our fourth project. Just such a tremendous honor to have the opportunity to work with them again on this incredible <laughs> project on music. You know, it's just a phenomenal opportunity for me. And when Christina phoned and said, hey, there's a possibility. And it's like, wow, really? It's like, you want to do the rock and roll piece? It's like, wow, that's so incredible. I was so, I was so taken aback. And Christina did such a beautiful job. And I mean, for me personally, it's always such a, a beautiful sight to see when my phone lights up. And it's Christina Katsolas phoning from the Southeast Museum of photography because I have a general feeling it's like this is going to be something good. Um, and wow, it certainly turned out to be. Um, it was such a great opportunity to work with her again. I mean, I've been working with the museum probably since 2014. This is our fourth project together. And every time it's just been absolute class. And to bring these musicians and this project that is very near and dear to my heart is really astounding such a privilege to be involved and to be to be asked to be a part of this exhibition and to create this exhibition with Christina. Um, so many of my <clears throat> favorite musicians, my God, from gosh, Beck, Bonnie Raitt, Roger Daltrey of The Who. It was just a staggering list of people that, um, you know, I've really been so blessed and to have spent any time with and to photograph. Um, really a tremendous honor. For me, music has always been in my bones, even from a small child, from six to seven, that music is probably what echoed and rang through me. Um, and then, of course, you know, for me to be able to photograph musicians is is such a huge step away from the work that I'm normally pursuing in, you know, a lot of times difficult countries, difficult subject matters, incredibly powerful. And then to step into something that's this beautiful creative space and these individuals who have harnessed, you know, the alchemy 
of what is music. Um, so to photograph musicians is a completely different experience for me, completely. For me, it takes me down to the heartbeat, the soul, the music, the infusion, the great and phenomenal talent of this one individual who's created something of absolute beauty. And that's so different than what I normally photograph. So it's a different resonance of soul. It's a different way to make photographs. And it's an incredibly deep and profound journey um, for me and being a musician myself, composing my own work. It just takes me down into that core of who we are as this metronome, which is our heart. And that's what beats our blood, it pushes it around our body and also pushes it around a sound system. Sound breaking is really an incredible project and it's really the history of recorded music and the history of production the history of musicians my god it takes in so many different aspects I mean, there must be hundreds of musicians that have been interviewed for this project and are a part of this project it's an eight-part series in every part <laughs> i've been deeply uh enjoyed because of my basic fanaticism for music and for me you know getting that call indeed that day also from jeff dupre of show of force that's the production company that really took this over and really created the the beautiful the beautiful rendering of what it is now and you know getting that call from Jeff really was a simple call because he he had reached out to me probably I'd say 2006 to go down to do a project in Antarctica East Island and I was going to be doing a series of stills um for another project that he was working on so that was really my introduction for him. And it was, you know, magical to receive that, that that phone call that said, hey, would you like to come on board with us again? I think this might resonate with you. And it's like, my God, it does. Who are we working with? Rick Rubin? That's who we're starting with? It's like, oh, 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 wow. Okay, Jeff, thank you for the gift of a lifetime, my God. Because not only was I making photographs, obviously, um, you know, I sat there through the entire interviews. So I'm hearing, my goodness, you know, Rick Rubin for two hours talking about music and all of these individuals, Amy Manns and Jimmy Iovine, you know, magical producers working with John Lennon and Springsteen and Tom Petty and Stevie Nicks and my God, a host of others. So it was really to receive that phone call and to say, yeah, we're going to be doing a series of interviews and we're just going to keep going and we'll give you a call whenever we're in LA and thank God I was in LA and most, if not all of the interviews took place in LA. So it was an easy hop, skip and a jump for me. Um, and it was just, you know, phenomenal, you know, working with some of these guys, it was incredible because sometimes they would generally incorporate two or three interviews per day. You're kidding. Like I'm, I'm, I'm having a day here where I'm talking to, I'm, I'm in the room here, your body rates magic her alchemy her words her passion her soul and then amy mann on the flip side in the afternoon it was um just incredible just incredible to to experience um and to learn so much from the deep deep wisdom of so many of these incredibly gifted musicians i was i was brought into the to the jerry lee lewis sessions um with ringo Starr and this whole incredible project was produced and put together by an incredible man called Steve Bing. And what his emphasis was and what he did was he recorded live in the record room, meaning all the musicians are playing at the same time, creating a perfect musical track. Not 80, 200 tracks recorded, put together, separate time. No, we've got everyone in the room at the same time. And then I'm inside that record room. Then if I press my shutter at the wrong moment and it gets picked up, that's a significant problem. I'm escorted out of that room and I'm not invited back. So you've got to be so, and I have to be so conscientious in situations like that. It's like, I wait for the, okay, we're going to change tape. That's my time. I can make a few images. I can move around. But the idea is not to be a distraction. I mean, even for Jerry Lee Lewis, I was told, whatever you do, don't get in his eye line. He doesn't want to see you. He's in the musical groove. He's in the musical landscape. And a lot of these 
people these i was going to call them cats because i just feel a lot of these individuals are in that musical landscape and they're used to those core people that they're working with and they're connecting eye to eye with those individuals in that room so it's so important for me to be invisible incredibly silent seen and not heard until it's my opportunity you know to make my images and sometimes yeah that would have to come at the very end of the interview then i would have them for sometimes as little as 30 seconds sometimes 20 minutes it just depended on the time that was allotted to me the photograph with rick was a real challenge because he was he was running to the airport <laughs> the interview had run over and he was just i gotta get out of here so he's pulling off the the lavalier which is a sound recorder handing it back to them and then that's my opportunity to hi rick my name is colin finley um I'd love to create a photograph with you. And it's just like, and I'm like, I'm sorry, Rick, it's only take 30 seconds. Even if you gave me 30 seconds, that's good enough for me. It's like, I found this location. I've already got it set up, the shutter speed, F-stop, everything's perfect. I just need you to slip into this position here. He goes, where do you need me? It's like, it's on the bus. It's like, good choice. So I moved him into, into the bus, put him there. And it was it was one of those moments um, happened identically with Bonnie Raitt, where I've already photographed the scene. Sly Stone was the same way. I already have the shutter speed, f-stop, everything's nailed. All I need is the person. So everything's been completely pre-visualized. All I need is Rick. All I need is Sly. All I need is Bonnie. All I need is Amy Mann. And that opens up that entire space and allows that photograph to happen. You know, that gets that really gets put into position because I've obviously spent the time ahead and during finding that perfect space where I want to make that portrait because I know my time is extremely limited with these individuals. Yeah, and, so and I need, with with Rick, it was just again, just an absolute gem of an individual. Just sat there for two, two and a half hours, just my God, having to continually force my jaw back up into my mouth because it was just reveal after reveal it was it was it was a master class just sitting there listening and of course the place where rick rubin does all of his recording is called shangri-la and that actually is the place where the band recorded some of their actual original music um eric clapton recorded there bob dylan everyone who was basically living on the west coast i mean that that feeling of that unique space I mean, still is what Rick uses today. Again, there's there's real there's real alchemy, there's real power, there's real essence of soul that flows through that studio and through that space. Um, you know, even the band's footprint was there in the in the in the cement, and that's also what I'm after too. Is you know what I refer to sort of as ephemera which are the images which aren't obvious. And I want to photograph the musical equipment. I want to photograph the old Mellotrons. I want to photograph all of these little pieces, a set list in the clubhouse with Tom Petty. I want to record these different elements that tell a different part of the story. And that's the, the goal when I'm put in a place like this, because as extraordinarily beautiful as they are, I also know that I will not be back in those places. So this is my one time inside the clubhouse. This is my one side, my one time at Shangri-La, Rick Rubin's, you know, church, if you will. So I made good use of my time and <laughs> photographed everything that I could possibly imagine for little bits and pieces that would further illustrate and tell a story. And I remember sitting there having lunch before going over to the clubhouse, knowing that I was going to be photographing Mike Campbell. It's like, my God, it's such an incredible sense of anticipation, not knowing what's going to be there, what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like. Um, and for me to walk into that space, that was indeed um, hallowed ground. It was the place of creativity. It was Shangri-La the essence, the energy, and it was the clubhouse for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Um, so much of their music, so many of the videos, I'm watching them on the making of Wildflowers and so many other projects and everything takes place in the clubhouse. And you walk into the clubhouse and 
just completely blown away because it's it's a museum. There were literally amplifiers stacked, got to be 30 feet high, 40 feet wide, 120, 200 amplifiers, guitars, two or 300 guitars. And it was just Ben Montench's pieces, all of his different keyboards. It's just so powerful to be in a place such as that. And Tom had uh, had passed. Um, and the memory of Tom and the legacy and what that music meant to me as a child or, um, you know, as a young man, probably at 14, you know, hearing his music for the first time. And that's what so much of this incredible journey about through music, through taking note, is so much of what I felt as a child and how deeply music resonated with me and for me. It was my savior in many ways. And then to have the opportunity, you know, to first hear Damn the Torpedoes, and then, you know, 35 odd years later to walk into this man's studio and to hear the stories and to soak up the power of the environment. Um, it was just such an incredible journey from my youth and what music meant to me, then to travel to these places and then to meet the individuals behind the music, behind the notes of the guitar and to see them and to experience that music um, and share with you some of their stories. And I just, I listen as a young disciple, as a young aspirant, um, who's many lifetimes away from what they can do musically. And I just, I find myself standing, staring at some of the images. It's like, don't even know what happened. Just this beauty of this magical moment, everything, all of the cells, all of the little points of beautiful, spectacular energy came together, resonated, and this image exists in the world. I happened to be the one behind the camera at that moment in time. Um, so just really um, surreal and beyond surreal, especially to have seen some of these incredible musicians in concert in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, than to actually be in front of them and to be photographing them and having this exchange and this experience. Um, music has always been so, so magical. I mean, when you hear these songs, it's like, my God, how is this even created? As children, yeah, we see we see photographs and, you know, it's all these incredible wonders of the world. Even when you see a bridge, it's like, my God, how was that bridge built? How was this song built? How was this song made? And who are these men that made it or these women that made it? You know, some of these projects are just so humbling. You know, four non blondes and, you know, what that, you know, powerful song meant to me back then and what it still means to me to this day. I mean, I can still walk down the road with that in my, in my ears and I can still well up because you just feel that power, you feel that passion, you feel that energy, you feel at times that rage. Linda was a special invitation that came later in the project after I would say the preliminary photography had all been done and all the interviews had been done is they wanted Linda for the cover along with Jimi Hendrix and I believe Johnny Cash and Marvin Gaye and they wanted Linda to be represented on that cover and it was another phenomenal opportunity um, a cherishing one of those golden moments why because selfishly the interview team wasn't there there was no negotiation. There's no, she's tired. She's got to go to lunch. She's got another meeting. It was like, yeah, roll to the house. I'll see you at 10. It was my God, you know, and I brought a couple of my books, the book, one of the books that we'd done together at the Southeast Museum of Photography of Consequence. And her brother answered the door, gave that book and testify just as a gesture and just sort of a gift of sorts. It's like, I'm, I'm arriving here in this in this extraordinary woman's home, which is also a recording studio. And it also, I think, amplifies up four times when you're invited to someone's home. 
studios are incredible they're great all this magic has happened there but this is where someone lives you know and that was a case with you know linda just absolute huge talent and humble as you could ever imagine i mean for me it was just she was so gracious she was so gracious and so forthright just like well what do you want to do and for me it's my all of my documentary my photojournalism i don't set up or stage stuff unless it's like a rick rubin photograph when it's like i've only got a very brief period of time here's the background rick portrait but with linda it would like took in all the documentary tradition that i have been you know a part of my entire life which is you don't stage or set up anything and it's just the question to linda when you know in answer to hers was what do you want me to do and it's like well what would you be doing if i wasn't here it's like i'd be sitting with my acoustic guitar right over there on my you know leather couch and i'd be working through songs working through music ad-libbing lyrics that's what I'd be doing right now if you weren't here. This is perfect. Let's do it. I'm not here. So I sat there for just, I don't even know, 20, 30 minutes. And she just rolled through a series of progressions, music, and just let it rip. And I just sat there five feet away on my knees with a 35 millimeter lens, probably three and a half, four feet away and just sat there and was in receivership of the most incredible, intense, powerful one-on-one -on -one concert you could I could ever imagine. The idea of having an experience like that, it felt so raw and so beautiful and so natural, and it wasn't forced. It was just, what would you be doing if I wasn't here? Let me just shadow you. And she was just as welcoming as you could ever imagine. And she moved over onto the piano, started. At that point, Honestly, I don't know. I mean, am I making pictures? Am I listening? Am I having a completely transcendent moment? Am I out of my body? Am I in my body? Is this a spiritual transcendence that's about to occur? Has it already occurred? Or am I having one at the moment? Because you're just in this experience that you're never going to have again in your life. And you're having this experience that an extremely minute people will ever have. And it's similar when I'm in photographing as difficult as it is in my past. I'm given these opportunities to make, you know, my alchemy happen with my camera and to be the recipient of Linda's extraordinary talent, the enormity of her heart and her gift of music. Um, again, I tend to always say that I'm in receivership of and absolutely humbled, um, you know, to have heard what it is that I heard and, to experience what I did with Linda and have her welcome me into her home and to frankly really like that photograph and to see that on the cover. It's like, yeah. And I love that she's representing who and what she is. And I'm freaking honored that I got to make that photograph and be a part of that and putting her in that place with Jimi Hendrix and with Johnny Cash and Marvin Gaye. It's like Linda Perry, right on. So it was um, having it be, be part of the poster and be part of the cover, you know, for me was really, um, it was powerful. When that call came through for what was to be that extraordinary, um, extraordinary day with Beck was, um, was really just so much of these time. I'm just like, my God, this is really going to happen. I'm being allowed into this place. And what Beck is doing, working with the incredible multi-Grammy nominated Greg Kirsten, who's worked with Pink and so many others, to be in his studio. And the idea was that Beck, as prolific as he is, along with so many of these other people, Linda Perry as well, are so unbelievably prolific, is that they wanted to take an opportunity and ask Beck to create a song from nothing. So when he walked in, that morning at 10 o'clock, blank sheet of paper, no lyrics, not a single note on a guitar, on a keyboard, on a piano, not a vocal, not anything, nothing. So how does Beck create and write a song from nothing? And then 
I'm invited into that place. And you see the process of him building up this song, writing these lyrics, the lyric sheets, the pages. And I was just, again, um, on my knees, invisible. And that was the beauty, again, of that moment where I know that I'm just simply forgotten, which is what I aspire to be, is to not be seen, to be known, to be observed, to disappear, to create the magic that Beck is giving and putting forth, and to see him and to hear him develop this song hour by hour as he moved through this, the vocals, the collaboration between Greg Kirsten and him. And just see this creative force, a beautiful song from absolutely nothing in a six or seven hour period. It's um, it's like the Wizard of Oz moment when you're allowed behind the screen by places to observe and to create and to be, you know, the witness and to create the images that, of course, um, the team is going to need to put together this project. He was just gracious and humbling as heck. You know, the photograph I made of him, one of them, a lot of them are inside the studio. That's Greg Kirsten's studio. Um, and some of the photographs are outside on the on the steps. And it was late afternoon, summer, so I was able to use the beautiful light as it reflected off the window behind me and just front filled him beautifully. So it was, it was just, when I walked out there, it's like, my God, I know in another half hour, the sun's going to come down and it's going to light this and it's going to fill him from the front. It's like right up there about 12, 15 steps. He goes, okay, is this good? Again, go down one. He goes, okay, you got it. And you thank him like I did. Thank you is never enough when you're given such gifts um, from these extraordinary people that are um, I hold in such high regard, being so frighteningly talented and gifted. Amy Mann was another extraordinary, you know, space. You know, I photographed other celebrities and there is a facade. It's image and acting. I have something to uphold here. And that's my internal directive is to see behind that mask. And some of the artists, they allow you past that space. Amy Mann is extraordinarily beautiful, but there's also something, the way that she's standing and the vulnerability, the hair falling across her face, you know, so to creating these images and to have the responsibility of delivering these images. So, so it's always been, um, you know, an incredible responsibility that is the gift of the hundreds of thousands of photographs that I've made in my career. That every one of those photographs leads up to this one image, this one moment, this one place in this hallway with Amy Mann into this studio with Beck or into the studio with Linda Perry. Everything that I know, everything that I've experienced sits front and present. And I bring everything that I am to the photographs. We're all unique individuals in that way. You know, for me, it's a tremendous honor photographing each and every single one of these individuals. I don't care if it's T-Ray from 2001 or it's, you know, some other new cat I just photographed six, seven months ago. It's time and it's the respect and it's the power that we put into creating what it is that we do. And I want to do my utmost to honor the people that I've photographed with the absolutely most extraordinary gift of an image that I can uh, to them, to me, to individuals who see it, who resonate with it. That, if anything, is my job. Every now and again, moments present themselves and, you know, it's just incredible word of mouth and people and how you meet certain individuals and how I was brought into the Jerry Lee Lewis campaign and then how that led to Fantastic Negrito bringing me on to do something to create some images for him. You know, those are totally different opportunities. Of course, this isn't, this is for an individual. This is, this is something very different as opposed to a client, um, even as opposed to a record label commissioning me to do a photograph. This is something much more personal. And with Xavier, who is by extension, Fantastic Negrito. You know, lived in South Central Los Angeles, and I'd spent four years working on a project there on this extraordinary inner city rodeo. So I'd spent four years scouring South Central locations, ideas, concepts, and this is where he lived. And I wanted to photograph Xavier um, exactly where he lived. I didn't want to take him any place else. It needed to be his own backyard. He just brought it. You know, um, those images. Um, are just so wrong. 
there's no pretense. It's just offering of soul. This is who I am. This is who I love. This is what I embrace. This is my music. This is an extension of my soul. And he's part James Brown. He's part Prince. He's part Stevie Wonder. He plays all the instruments, every note, and just creates this, again, powerful alchemy. And then it's my job to bring my alchemy to him. And that's where, you know, two minds meet with T. Ray, with Brock Monroe. When individuals, you know, commission me to work for them, you're building something with someone. I'm going to spend, you know, eight, nine hours with Brock a couple of days creating all those images in multiple locations, which I've all scouted ahead of time to drop him into certain places. And then for us to improvise and riff. The same thing with, um, you know, Xavier and Fantastic Negrito. It's like, we're just driving down in my car. It's like, let's go here. Let's check this out. What about here? So it was a lot of us just discovering and just the images again felt very raw. They felt I mean, closest to me into that pure, almost photojournalism documentary tradition. Fantastic Negrito we happen to be frighteningly talented musicians. And there's a rawness and there's an energy that he brings. I mean, I've seen him in small venues. <laughs> We're talking 60 people packed in like sardines in a place that can comfortably hold 30. And he was frightening, impassioned, bold, beautiful, flowing, and owning every person in that audience for a small intimate venue that wasn't done for record industry type people. So a lot of these cats, I feel, embody their music and who and what they are. And it comes through in everything that he does, his background, what happened to him when he fell into that coma and losing his record contract, all of these things that he's overcome. A lot of things, basically a lot of these people, we've all got obstacles in our life. We've all had to overcome difficult experiences to get to that next place of discovery of self and our journey here in this world and what we want to bring. These are people bringing their hearts and souls to the world and putting it out for offer. Every moment behind a camera is a gift for me. And to create with something, a beautiful co-conspirator, let's create magic together. Let's create a moment. Let's create one twenty-fifth of a second together. And let's have it last a lifetime. For me and the music that I write, um, most if not all of it is intended to be the voice of my photographs. And that's why, again, I felt very powerfully that I need to be the one to translate that. It's how I build the music layer by layer by layer, sometimes as many as 60 different layers in one track, finding the voice for that individual or for that landscape or for that polar bear that is in the photograph. Who is Voyager? Am I the Voyager? Yeah, I'm definitely the Voyager. Yeah, I'm continually trying to interpret what is my soul. And that is the gift of music, is that it can give, I feel, my soul. A photograph can reflect my soul. It's made from my soul. The music is the voice of that photograph. And that is what I have always been in search of. And the music, again, is transcendent. My voice is not transcendent. My words are not transcendent. My music can be transcendent. And that's, I think, what happens when we go to concerts is that we are lifted, all of the audience members, to a certain musical frequency, a sonic frequency that all of us vibrate on when we're all collectively together. And then 500, 1,000, 20,000 people are resonating all together, our bodily instruments this frequency so we are all humming to the same space which is why i think it's difficult when the concert's over and you and then you end you go to the concert and then you feel that huge letdown because of that beautiful embodiment of that collective musical soul that sonic energy has been dispersed and that was the aspiration for me with music was seeing other you know wonderfully gifted ambient musicians that come out there with a laptop or two press play, they're doing their thing. Not a lot going on. They're doing, a lot of it's pre-programs. And behind them is a black stage with a black curtain. And for me, that was that moment of like, in that audience that one time, it was like sitting back going, wow. It's like, what if I put polar bears behind me? What if I put Antarctica back there? Then I'm taking people to another place. 
it's visual. I'm not singing the lyrics. They're not having to listen to me. They can just absorb and let it wash through them. I need to say nothing and let the audience have their own journey with the music, with the imagery. Let it take them where they want it to take them to. Give the music, give the photographs to the audience and step back. Again, sometimes I didn't even want my name attached to this when the documentary came out. I didn't want to be identified as male or female. I didn't want to be identified as this country, that country, wherever I was from, whatever color of my skin, because none of that matters. It's just the gift. It's just the returning the gift to the world of the images that have been given to me. And that's really what Hearts Road was. And that's what that music was, is how can I best effectively give the gift that I've been given by the world through these photographs? How can I place this back into the arms of the world? that gave it to me. And music became that way for me to do that. Music was that additional language that I needed to learn how to speak. They could take me from being a photographer to something that was more multimedia. And I could be communicating with people in a different space in a movie theater with images moving and music and putting it out there as a documentary. But the music was a key to that because without the music, it's nothing. It's just slides. But the music changes everything. It's done the way it's supposed to be done with nothing other than my intentions of putting it into the world. Not because I was going to get paid, not because there was anything there, not because there are any awards, any accolades, nothing. It's done with purity of intention. With my heart, my soul, and my offering to the world, this is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. This is what the world has given me. Now it belongs to you. And that was the gift of Hearts Road and the gift of the music. Um, in my relationship with you, Christina, in the Southeast Museum of Photography, it's been magical. I don't actively seek out museums and galleries to have exhibitions or shows. That's not, it's not my modality. I want to work with people that I hugely respect and admire and even love. And knowing that my images are going to be seen and they're going to be beautifully, beautifully displayed and put forth. And that comes from your heart, Christina. You know, so it's such an honor and such a privilege to work with you at the Southeast Museum of Photography once again, and then to see this work find its beautiful home and place at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. It means the world to me. I love working with you guys. If you haven't already seen it, Taking Note is going to be on exhibition at the Atlantic Center for the Arts through February 3rd. It's in the Master Gallery, so give it a shot. As a young kid, I was I was so desperate for music. I mean, I would even, I had one of those little handheld, little $9.99 recorders from Radio Shack, and I would hold it up to the one speaker on the right side of the stereo of my parents and press play to record a song by a band. And to press pause at the end, it's like, my God, I've, I've captured something. And then to be able to build another song on top of that. And I'm this little eight, nine-year-old making playlists for myself that are captured on one speaker of a 999 Radio Shack recorder and carrying this with me. And I think all of us carry these soundtracks of our lives. And that's what's really cool about this, is that um, this exhibition, we've created a Spotify soundtrack series of songs that I hope you'll love and find inspiring. And I would hope there's an opportunity for you to add some of your own songs to this or create your own song list or share your song list with us. Because I've certainly um, got song lists. <laughs> song lists have been in and Spotify must have probably two or 300 songs <laughs> that I've created. It's ridiculous. Um, but it keeps me going. It's always there when I want to spin to this, spin to that, spin to this. And it's, and it's there. So it's I even create soundtracks for my for my novels that I write. So music has just been like, my God, it's brought such, it's serenity. And it's so calming. Sometimes there's nothing more beautiful than a road trip by yourself because I'm just going to have three, four hours of music. As a kid, I would get half my age in allowance per month. And to save up for that first little single, that first little 45. And I'd saved up my money and I went down there on that journey down to Sears Roebuck, I think it was, and got my little my little Rolling Stones little single and came back and played that. And it was going to be the greatest moment of my life. Butter was going to melt in my ears. And to play that song and to have my father bellowing, turn that crap off. 
there'll be no Rolling Stones played in this house. So the next day on Sunday, we actually had to go back to Sears and Roebuck and I actually had to exchange the, the 45 RPM of the Rolling Stones song. And I was given, you know, Donny Osmond puppy love to come home with. So music, even from a young kid, something I had to fight for. And we're given the tremendous gift now of having these incredible soundtracks and millions of songs are easily accessible. Um, I come from the old days and you had to work a little harder for it but it's no less enjoyable. So definitely check out the Spotify soundtrack and um, make one of your own. And I ask you now, what's your favorite song? What was that first, that first memory? For some of us, it was an album. For some of us, it was 45. For some of us, depending on our age group, you know, it's going to be, you know, iTunes. Where did we find ourselves on that spectrum? Where did I find myself? I created something called um, Songs for Life. And these are the, those were going to be the 10 most important songs for me and what they meant. You know, for all of us, it's going to be different. You know, for me, it might be This is the Sea by the Water Boys. Moments that touch us in life, through our childhood, through our experiences, through our loves, through our losses. The music has been there as a constant companion for, humbly, I can say, most of us, certainly for me. So what are your most important songs? What are you most inspired by? What do you listen to in your brightest moments? What do you listen to in your darkest moments? Feel free to share them with us. Jeff Dupre from the show Force was really a powerful force in making this whole sound-breaking project happen, and he's the one, obviously, that believed in me enough to give me that call and to put me involved with him with this year-and-a-half-long project to finish. And the whole culmination of it, sound breaking, it was you know something that's going to be an incredible aspect of this exhibition to share with you. They've graciously given us their their stories, the eight part project from sound breaking, and um, I think everyone will find something incredibly important to them and to their lives and what music has meant to them. There's eight sections to it, so there's a lot of content in there. You can't even imagine a project like this is ever going to come your way. To be involved in it, to be asked to be involved in it, um, was really extraordinary. And I've worked with um, Show Force and a few other projects as well, but this one, the sound breaking was just, means a lot. It means the world. It's, it's, it's music. It's the gift of music. And it's giving me the opportunity, you know, to put forth my best in my work into this world and into this project for them. So definitely check out the sound breaking. Definitely check out, I would be checking out all eight, <laughs> all eight chapters for sure if I was you. And I'd also recommend making sure it's a part of your permanent collection.